We have our inbox constantly full. We constantly have messages coming in. Work email just went up to 101. We have 99 plus. 679 unread emails. We're here to talk about a major problem. Today, the world we live in is full of more sales noise than ever before. Everybody's inboxes are full and overflowing. I can really feel the effects of digital pollution for myself and my team. Attention has never been more scarce. The more noise that's out there in the world, the harder it is to stand out. Need revenue, traffic, or both? Delete! Unfortunately, that digital pollution, that's growing. The amount of noise going on makes it extremely difficult can't fully psychologically detach from work. Work's in your whole life. How do you not give your whole life to it? Digital pollution results in a complete distrust of digital media. If there's no trust, then there's no way forward. Until there's a new technology that changes the calculus, it'll just keep getting louder. Can I take this? Hey Sherry, in the middle of an interview right now, but tell me you've got good news. No, you don't have good news. We need thoughtful, human-centered communication. We're on a quest to disrupt all this noise. Do I get overwhelmed with my phone and technology? Yeah, it's, it's fundamentally overwhelming and it's a lot. It's all the ways that things catch your attention and divert your train of thought. You need a break. I'm having this conversation right now and I can't look at my phone and it's amazing. It's like a break, right? We're here to talk about a major problem. My name's Kip Bodner and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at HubSpot. I probably get 10 to 15 phone calls a day unwanted and I probably get 50, 100 emails a day unwanted. My name is Ed Brialt, Chief Marketing Officer at Abrimo. I just checked my phone and I've got 99 plus unread emails. By the end of this interview, I'll have at least 30 new emails. My name is Yasmin Mormon. I am Chief Business and Operating Officer at Hunt a Killer. I've already accumulated 62 <laughs> in the last two hours. So I've been at Hunt a Killer for almost six, six months. But you know, the marketers have started finding me, I must say. Digital pollution for me, it's the sheer volume of communications and content that are flowing out in the market. All of that, that's not valuable. It's the waste product of what we're trying to do voluntarily or involuntarily you know it's not all of it's ill intended it's just it's a byproduct of the technology that we have and the the mediums of communication and constraints that we have is there good or potentially helpful unsolicited outreach out there there probably is I, as a consumer, have made a choice. I'm gonna give you my time. I need to have some knowledge and trust with you. you know, you're going through your emails and you're, you're trying to make sure you're, you're getting up to date on everything that people are reaching out to you for and you've gotta wade through a good number of, of sales outreach, right? Sometimes things can seem valuable on the surface but lead to untrustworthy events or, or kind of exchanges. Even if it sounds great, if I don't have that initial bar of trust, it's very, very unlikely I'm gonna engage. Individuals can really get a sense for the bullshit uh, that's coming their way. They don't appreciate it. And I think that uh, those of us who wanna continue to put it out there are gonna be losing the game of, of building great relationships. Someone listening to this might say, you know, why? But why doesn't this person have more curiosity? How else are they gonna to get to you? And you never know what you'll discover if you don't explore what it is that they're offering. And look, that, that is a fair response, but that requires more research than I'm prepared to do in a moment of breezing through my emails. It's asking more curiosity of me than I think is warranted and is wise. They surely have the same workday that I do, and that probably doesn't work for them, so why do they think it's gonna work for me? 
When I think about noise and trying to get that out of my life, I, I think about it through my most scarce resource, which is my time and attention. Is it worth my attention over here versus like me spending a moment with my son or cooking a meal with my son? The answer is almost always no. We also know that the byproduct of that noise is feeling overwhelmed, feeling like there's not enough signal and that you feel discombobulated or confused. That's at least how I feel. So I also try to protect myself from those feelings as well. All right, I just pulled one up. I got it. I, I got it approximately 40 minutes ago, this unwanted email. And the subject line is not great. It is, I'm trying to connect with Kip at HubSpot. There's, there's no context. I don't know why. We're on a first name basis already. That's, that's very, very kind of you. Um, and then the body of the email is, is this the correct email address for Kip? That's the whole email. And I don't know what to do with that. There's no context. There's nothing. That is a very representative, I'm sad to say, example of what I get on a daily basis. In my last role, I don't remember getting so many emails where people tried to come off palsy. Like, I'm your buddy. Someone told me to reach out to you. Like, I, I, I feel like I get a lot of that. I, in fact, one of them was like, um, the, the way it was framed, I actually thought that, oh, someone in my company asked this person to reach out to me, and I read, I was like, no, that, there's no way, which I was offended by, actually. I thought that was really inappropriate. A lot of them are very straightforward, you know, like, need revenue, traffic, or both. Okay. Like, it's completely transparent what they're doing, right? They're pulling no punches, but I'm like, delete, I don't need it. <laughs> hey, Ed, the similarity between Kudzu and everyone starting a podcast is that they're both highly invasive and most times unwanted by everyone. Would it be a terrible idea of us to discuss in more detail? Yes, it would be. The subject line for me just didn't connect. I would have just scrolled right past it. It just, it blends right into every, all the other noise that's in the inbox. Looking at this email, uh, it's outreach around a company wants to help me with podcasting. and. It's kind of devoid of anything that we're already doing in podcasting. You know, at HubSpot, we do a lot of work in podcasting. It doesn't really acknowledge that at all. It talks about how that company has helped other companies be successful. It doesn't talk about, one, how they would help me be successful or HubSpot be successful. It also doesn't have the context of the work we're already doing and maybe how they would help us build off of that. It seems very one-sided, like, what's in this for, for me? It's like. Do you even know if podcasting's a problem for me or not? I don't, I don't really know. And so this is definitely the type of email that if I did open, I would, I would get filed away pretty quickly. I liken it to what direct mail used to be, right? It's like a train that keeps going and until there's a new technology that changes the calculus, the train will just keep moving. It'll just keep getting louder. We are no longer fooled by an email that says, Dear Melissa, because we know that that is a field that says insert first name. Personalized emails are meaningless to us anymore. There's this question about trust in email. The thing with trust is that we don't trust anonymous others. If there's no trust, then there's no way forward. I've even got a message that said, Hey, first name bracket first name like immediately that's going to send off a, a red flag after that i'm not even reading the rest of the message to be honest my name is dr melissa gracious and i am a productivity specialist i help overworked and overwhelmed people feel focused balanced and successful my name is andrew brodsky I'm an assistant professor of management at the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. I do research on the way we interact at work with a particular focus on virtual interactions and virtual work. My name is Kostin Kushlev and I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Georgetown University. 
the main topics of my research are well-being, happiness, and how all of that relates to technology, notifications, and our 24-7 presence online. We are here today to discuss digital pollution, which is unwanted interruptions caused by technology and those who are using it to put mass communication out there rather than thoughtful, human-centered, targeted communication. Digital pollution is the absolutely overwhelming nature of digital media that are hitting us every time we look at our phones or open our computers. The idea of digital pollution is the idea that we have our email inbox constantly full. We constantly have messages coming in such that our work ends up polluting other parts of our life as well. I have five unread emails in my inbox right now. Those are five unmade decisions. A client two days ago had a over a thousand unread emails in his inbox. That's a thousand unmade decisions. To me, that indicates an issue that we need to probe further. It's hard to say when the transition from being on a shift clock to having no clock happened, but I'll bet if you ask individuals when that happened for them personally, most of them, me included, will say, oh, it's when I got my first phone that would check my email. Back when the internet first started, email was a very formal setting. It was always uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, comma, and then a very well-written email. In schools, they even used to teach how to write very professional emails. Now, memes, gifts, everything under the sun is just sent in email, and it's now become a comfortable setting. When interactions were fully focused on face-to-face -face in the office, your work interactions were limited by the hours you were in the office. But with email now, you can respond at any point of the day thereafter. And people are often rewarded for doing so. So there's this feeling and need to, if you want to get the promotion, if you want to get the raise, that you need to be shown that you're really responsive, regardless of what hour of the day it is. So as a result of that, people are often stuck in the situation where work is invading their life. Good Technologies has found that people on average contribute an additional eight hours of work per week in checking their email after business hours. So in terms of some semblance of life-work balance, checking our email means we are never checked out of work. There's been shown to be a lot of um, benefits to what's called psychological detachment after work. When you have the time and the space to detach from your work, you tend to be more effective. And when you spend all night checking your phone, checking your work emails, responding to them, that ends up polluting your life in that you can't enjoy your time outside of work as much. You can't fully psychologically detach from work. And as a result of that, it can increase burnout and it can make people less satisfied overall. This is something that we weren't really prepared for as humans. The iPhone or the Android phone in your pocket we did not prepare for that. That was not really part of the evolutionary plan. And so we're learning on how we are going to interact with all of this technology. In this digital platform that we created, everybody's reachable. There's something called the death of distance. So the distance between myself and someone in Africa has shrunk. You can just reach anyone at any moment in time as much as you would like with no ramifications because just like me with my almost 32,000 emails, you can just ignore it. Smartphones have uh, kind of changed the name of the game, right? 
Now we're checking our email or other notifications while we're spending time with other people or while we're you know, taking uh, a nature walk or whatever it might be. So it kind of interrupts all these other uh, activities and that has consequences for the benefits we reap out of those activities, right? So it's not just that they kind of adds more stress, but it also prevents us from reaping the full benefits of a nice face-to-face -face interaction, for example. If you're working a really hard work task and all of a sudden an instant message pops up and it breaks your concentration, or you're trying to really enjoy your time with your family and then your phone dings, and that kind of breaks the mood there. So it's not so much the number of notifications that I would argue is problematic, it's the idea that it, it decreases focus, whether it's in a particular work task or whether it's in your life. And those interruptions can be quite problematic. Imagine a person who receives 300 email messages per day. That is 300 buzz that takes their attention away from the important task at hand to whatever has come in via email. Your email inbox is so overwhelming. So much is coming in every hour, every day, and it just piles and piles and piles. And people just leave it there. A lot of my clients just are leaving their inboxes to let them grow. Meanwhile, their stress is growing, their feeling of accomplishment is going down, and they don't trust themselves or other people to communicate well. The amount of noise going on makes it extremely difficult to get a genuine message through to someone. We learn because of spam email to ignore incoming messages. We learn frustration. We learn distrust. That anger, that lack of trust, that lack of connection makes us approach emails that actually are important and relevant and directed at us with the same skepticism and distrust. We ignore these messages because it's noise. Um, there's a lot of noise throughout the day. And so with this noise, you can see all the messages that you get, and you want to look at the ones that make you feel something or that you have a connection with. So all the other ones, you just simply don't open. The problem is when you don't know someone really well, it's very hard to build trust over email to get the message across properly. We're also missing, you know, all these other social signals, right? Your facial expressions don't really show up in email. And you know, emoticon just doesn't cut it the same way as facial expressions do. It cannot replace hundreds of thousands of years of evolution uh, with, within 15 years, right? It's not exactly quite the same. Digital pollution results in a lack of connection because we have to approach our email inboxes with a barrier, with a wall, with armor against our time being wasted or something more malicious. And companies practicing that are trying through volume, just sheer volume, to get some bites on the, the hook. People continue to send these canned messages out because it's a numbers game. You can reach out to 100,000 people and maybe get 10, 20, 30, even a hundred to reply and try to go from there. However, the other thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are not going to reply to you, you may have not burnt that bridge, but you have some repairing to do. Not having those richer modes of interaction to gain trust, to gain that initial understanding, so then you can then read between the lines later on in emails can be harmful. You want to create that genuine connection that raises those psychological barriers to where they're connected with you, and it's a little bit harder to say no because they know you actually care for them. My name is Ni Adeshokin. I lead a sales team at a firm here in uh, Chicago. I am Carrie Smith. Uh, by day, I am in sales. 
I am Michael Stamison. I am the business development manager for Rolig Logistics. My name is Caroline Cray. We sell restaurant platform software and hardware. I'm Colin Cray. I'm a North American e-mobility sales manager. I'm Eliza Loftus. I am an SDR team lead and I live in New York City. Lori Dunn. I am director of sales at Inficense. Hi Dan, this is Carrie Smith with Factor 8. I'm going to send you an email with a video explaining why I'm calling you out of the blue. Thanks, I'll talk to you soon. A lot of the folks we're looking to reach are being bombarded with messaging from us as well as our competition. As a stakeholder, right, how do you determine which product makes sense for you or which email you even want to engage with? That ability to actually have that first meeting to engage with them, therein lies our biggest challenge. Do I feel like the content that I'm putting out to people to talk them into booking a meeting with me, do I think that's digital pollution? Some of it is. Some of it has to be to keep the steps moving, which is really making me rethink some things like as I'm just sitting here. Law of averages, if I ping 100 people, I hope 10 of them are legit, and of those 10, I hope two are opportunities, and of the two, I hope one works. Touches, customer touches, and that's phone calls, emails, voicemails, LinkedIn, just touches. The wider the net you cast, the more touches, the better. A big focus no longer is just the actual transactional, the sales, like the dollars. There's also this big rush at end of the month, end of the quarters, to hit their numbers. So maybe they actually don't take the time to do research because at the end of the day, that's their focus, is the KPIs instead of the actual worth or return of what they'll be. Emails I make or send around six to 800 emails a day. And that's just like outbound emails. We are a high volume outbound team. So typically we're all rounding out the week around somewhere between 2,000 to 3,500 emails a week. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of emails. Yeah. <laughs> I'm constantly like talking to other people or getting feedback because I want to hit that goal and I want to like help the whole team succeed. So I'm constantly communicating with people, slacking, asking for feedback on stuff. One of the KPIs is just ensuring that, you know, we have at least 50 touch points on a weekly basis with prospects, with merchants that we're working with. It could be a phone call for the touch point. It could be, you know, a response to a, a thread of three, four, five emails. So just the activity engaging with merchant prospects is really what we ask for. Yeah, commission is stressful. I've definitely not hit quota plenty of times and it's extremely stressful. Every month, every quarter, that dial goes back to zero. You do have to be competitive. The fact is, we're all tied to a number. There's a dashboard, there's a list, and folks in sales typically want to see their names at the top of that list. When the months are leaner and the meetings aren't coming in quite as much, you just keep picking up the phone. You keep dialing, you keep emailing, you keep sending videos. It's fun to see people succeed and see those wins, but it's really difficult when someone's doing everything right from the outside, but they're just not seeing those results. And I know because I've been in that position before and I'm in that position of reaching out to people right alongside them, but it's really difficult to like keep someone motivated when they're not hitting their goals and they appear to be doing all the right things. I definitely use my tone of voice if I'm on a cold call. If I am doing outreach, of course there's opportunities to have a good one-liner in an email. That's where video comes in, because you can see me, because this is who you're getting. You never use templated things and be really basic and plain, because is that what you're going to bring to this relationship? No. I think staying on top of trends and communication is really important. Everybody's inboxes are full and overflowing. What has helped me break through that noise is creativity and video. I've been really working on humanization at scale. I don't have time to do tons of research and personalize everything, but I can scale me and my personality and my stories and my kids and my dog. And so that's been working. Work-life balance, what is it like at the moment? <laughs> That's hilarious. 
Oh, this is a good one. 24 seven. <laughs> this idea of the general nine to five or like, hey, you have weekends off or like go enjoy your holiday. Wasn't this something that I, I necessarily grew up with anyway, but I think work-life balance is what people decide to make of it. Some days do I work a lot of hours? Yeah, but are there some days where I get to work not as many hours because of the timing? Sure. Being an SDR, it's definitely difficult to have that work-life balance and still be dialed in all the time. When I see that someone in Australia replies to me and it's 9 p.m. and I'm in my bed watching TV, I feel the need to reply and I want to get back to them as soon as I can. It's difficult, it's a grind and my hard work paid off. I got that meeting, so I want to go ahead and set it up. Do I get calls from overseas late at night? Do I get calls from overseas early in the morning? Yes, that's kind of the job. There's no stop. Work's in your whole life. How do you not give your whole life to it? It's such a juxtaposition. And I think any salesperson worth their salt would say this, you can always be working. There's always one more email you can send or check uh, one more call you can make. My phone, as unfortunate as it sounds, it's my right hand. I'm married to it and it's a loveless marriage. <laughs> can I take this? Would it be cool? Do you need footage of me taking a call or should we keep going? Hey Sherry, in the middle of an interview right now, but tell me you've got good news. <laughs> no, you don't have good news. Even more so now, in our pandemic state than before. There's this need to always be very, very responsive whenever someone's looking for you to provide a direction or answer somewhere. It's something my wife talked about. She's like, me, like you literally don't eat when you work from home. Like you're going from meeting to the other, one meeting to the other. The stress of sales, of constantly people hanging up on you, cursing at you, just ignoring you, um, leaving you out to dry, that is stressful. Here's another email of someone saying, never email me again. Or here's another email of someone saying, stop in all caps. You have to really focus. I, you know, I meditate a lot. I do a lot of yoga, meditation in the morning. I'm with the dog all the time, constantly out walking. You know, we walk six to eight miles or so a day. She loves being outdoors chasing bunnies. So I'm always finding a way to be closer to nature and more centered in. There's never a break. Every month we need sales. Every month we have goals and there's never an opportunity to stop. There's only so many hours in a day and in sales development we're expected to book so many meetings and do so many activities. To keep it human while keeping up the pace is a really tricky line. Today the world we live in is full of more marketing and sales noise than ever before because there's more and more companies trying to reach humanity and businesses than ever before. And to do that, do that well is hard. And it takes time and people are largely impatient. Noise is a byproduct of humanity's impatience. It's an interesting question whether email is sustainable, whether it's gonna disappear in the coming years. It's probably gonna stick around for a long while. The reason being is that I haven't seen other good replacements. So the issue with instant messaging or chat is that it's very interrupting. You're, there's this expectation that you have to respond more quickly. And it's not easy to access records of it afterwards as it is with email. Email's got this nice, potentially happy medium in some ways, in that you can send more information, it's easily accessible, and people can do it on their own time. I don't see anything completely replacing email. It will continuously evolve and uh, be disrupted. We might have more mediums to which we move through it, but uh, I definitely think it will always be there. We need a way to send messages. It's how we send it, it's what we send, it's when we send. That's all what ne really needs calibrated. 10 years from now, your email, your inbox is probably still going to be flooded. The amount of data out there that's being sold um, is continuing to grow, and so there's going to be a significant amount of digital noise out there. We're learning to be better users of technology, be better citizens of the internet. And based on that, some people are really developing a keen sense that, hey, this, this email seems very fishy, or this email seems very bot-like, or it seems very ingenuine. Well, you don't really care enough about me to send me a message. You sent this email, the very same email, to thousands of other people. Why would I reply to you when you didn't really even send it to me? 
it comes down to attention, right? I mean, how much attention, how much of your attention and cognitive resources are you giving to like what looks like a spam email? Attention has never been more scarce. The more noise that's out there in the world, the harder it is to stand out, you know, to have real signal amongst that noise. But at the same time, if you can stand out and you can create value, you can build trust much faster because there's so much noise out there and so much distrust out in the world that when somebody comes across a brand and a company and a business that is full of trust and sees them for who they are and the problems they have, then that trust can be built so, so quickly. We have learned the value of connection and the importance of being creative, being intentional, being personal with our connections. What a salesperson could do to, to reach someone um, through all this uh, digital pollution and digital noise that exists out there is attempt to create something that is genuine. Do something that is more genuine than your everyday email. It's those pieces of understanding the person, getting to know the person. We don't trust anonymous others. When we feel like we know the other person, it can work a lot better to build trust. I have to see something about myself in that email. If I don't see something about myself in that email immediately, I'm not even gonna read it. I would get hooked if I saw not just my name, but things about me that I would know it took you time to research. If I saw something very truly personal about it, not just identifiable about me, but something personal that I actually have an emotional attachment toward, I would, uh, I would open that email. To cut through the noise, how much of it is about being human? All of it. Our approach is very human. We have a lot of jokes and funny gif of, of us chasing them down and funny subject lines. We have um, a lot of like humor in our outreach and people will reply and be like, wow, that's what I needed today. Like, that's funny. Sure, I'll meet with you because you're funny. So I, I think the humor is what is really unique about our approach. There was one email that I must say definitely got kudos for creativity. Hunter Killer is a game company that focuses around storytelling and puzzles and, and things like that. And the salesperson created a cipher, like a puzzle, to have to solve for the outreach, <laughs> which I thought was a lot of time, eh? Um, <laughs> but I gave them credit for being super creative and actually thinking about what might get my attention, given what my company does. I was like, okay, I will, I will definitely give you the time of day. This is good. I just don't think that many of them spend the time to craft something that is targeted and personalized. It takes too long. It, it wrecks your numbers game, right? But I think those who really take the time to go through whatever CRM they have and, and target that audience, then it's a, then the numbers game actually matters, right? It's all about honing your craft and understanding what that person's looking for. A mistake that I see when it comes to like unwanted communication is just kind of laziness, you know? Oh, I just need to send 200 emails today. And they're not thinking about who those 200 people are, what those 200 people need. It's this misperception of, well, I need to have this quantity of activity to achieve this result I want. No, you need a certain number of people to engage with you to achieve the uh, certain result that you want. And that may take five emails or that may take 500, but you're more likely to save everybody time if you are thoughtful and you care about the humanity of the person and all the people that you're trying to engage with. I believe like digital sales is like now the modern day of like cold calling or like going door to door. So when someone all of a sudden starts like sending you random things that don't pertain to any interest, that shows me like they're just doing blanket emails. Every time you do that, you become that future like telemarketer that we all hate. Particularly now that we're in a virtual world, I think it's quite important to think about how to build those relationships. It's very hard to build that social connection when you are virtual, when you're just kind of engaging over email. There's no substitute for human interaction, and that's, that's the absolute same, I, at least I feel, for, uh, for the business world. I, I would much rather be able to shake someone's hand and, and look them in the eye. We're designed for that communication 
face to face. We're designed to, to be able to see one another. We're designed to be able to interact with one another, to, to touch one another, to, sh to shake hands, bump fists, hit elbows, whatever you choose to do. We're losing that human interaction. So that's what digital pollution is in a nutshell. It's the lack of humanity behind what we as a society are moving towards. And that's super unfortunate for me. We're seeing lots of interesting new ways that people are approaching communication. One is obviously Zoom, Microsoft Teams, these virtual meetings. Um, we're seeing video emails coming out now as an interesting thing as well. The idea is with Microsoft Teams or Zoom meetings, everyone needs to be there at the same time. But video emails, the idea behind those is that you have that added richness that you don't get an email, but you can watch them at your own time as well. Once we started using video outreach, everyone on the team adopted it very quickly because it was so easy and also very fun to do and it really had a great response. I remember the first three videos I sent, I got like three positive responses and I was like, whoa, this is a game changer. I also feel around the time when video outreach was incorporated was a time when we were all holed up in our houses and not talking to people and someone opening an email with me like smiling in my bedroom was really attractive and that it's like wow like that's a person and they're not just a robot sending me a thousand emails a day because a lot of sales outreach can feel like it's a bunch of robots and sometimes it is a bunch of robots. When I first came on board, I was doing 60 to 80 dials a day and then probably sending about that same number of emails. But lately, I've made a complete shift to putting video into my sequences. And that personalization, humanization, it's been revolutionary for me, where I'm making very few calls now, 20-ish, maybe a day, but I've doubled or tripled the number of meetings. Even if my customers don't put their camera on, I'm usually on camera on every call, just so they can see me. Again, it's that personality, personable side. Like, I need you to know who you're buying from, this is me. That's where the body language, everything comes in. You lose so much nuance when you're trapped just to a phone, just to text. I don't know if I like or trust you because I heard your voice on a voicemail or I talked to you for a few minutes. We're people and we make instant judgments about if you like or tr might be able to trust somebody based on what they look like, how they sound, how they're carrying themselves. It's been a huge help for me with the video because they can, they can see me and they can make that judgment a little faster with more accuracy. I think that it brings out so much more than other forms of media. It's the body language. We have so much to say without saying anything at all. It's the eye contact. We've been, as humans, communicating this way for thousands of years. And to take ourselves out of it is, um, we really heighten the cognitive load in communications when we do that. People don't want to hear machines. People don't want to hear bots. People want to hear you. You want to raise your hand up and say, hey, I'm a person and I'm honestly trying to connect with you because I care. Not simply just because, hey, I just want to make a sale as well. I have some technology or I have a solution that may benefit you and may benefit your organization. And I care enough to reach out to you and tell you about it. I'm an optimist, so I see all the positives that technology can bring. Now I think we're at a point where it's about finding the right balance with technology. Using technology to automate and do things that can really save you time. But then if you're going to save that time, don't go and spend that just on more and more technology. Spend that in building great relationships, doing meaningful work, solving meaningful problems. The best way to cut through the digital pollution is with personal connections. Disproportionately put your time there, create deep personal connections, invest, and building relationships. That's the only way to build business today.